Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Shaju May um, from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Uh, he's an officer at the School of Information and the College of Engineering. Um, he has served as the founding director of the Applied Data Science Master's Program at the University of Michigan. And he has been working a lot in the areas of data mining, machine learning, natural language processing, and information retrieval. Uh, has had a uh, astonishing publication track record, uh, having multiple best paper awards from ICML, WWW, Wisdom, KDD. Uh, he is an ACM distinguished member. And um, most of you are too young to be at the CIR 2018, uh, but if you've been there in Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, Shoju was the general co-chair of that conference. I was there. Uh, I think that was the second CIR conference I've ever attended. Um, and uh, he's been serving as a uh, uh, the, the associate editor being on the ed editorial board of the journal Machine Learning Research, ACM Transactions on the Web, and IEEE Transactions on Big Data. Uh, so the list goes on. I don't, uh, I think I don't need to read everything about uh, Shaju's accomplishments. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let's welcome our speakers virtually this year talk series. Well, thank you very much, uh, Hamid. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Um, well, uh, thanks for the very warm uh, introduction and the invitation. It has been a great pleasure to um, uh, visit uh, CIAR virtually. Um, we had lots of connections, uh, and you know, I know lots of friends who graduated from there, uh, and um, you know. Uh, my advisor Chen Jai was uh, graduated from CMU, and there's a strong tie there as well. Um, the uh, very first, um, uh, I think, the very first paper that we submitted to CIR was about uh, you know statistical language models used in IR, and you all know that where those uh, original ideas came from. Um, so, uh, but this talk, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, something a little bit different from. Uh, conventional uh, computer science research um, or machine learning research uh, uh, in a way that we talk about a little bit, um, you know, how we do interdisciplinary research uh, related to AI. Uh, and the reason is that, um, you know, many people have been asking me, uh, what's special about doing data science in the high school? Because my home department is in the School of Information, uh, not in CS. Uh, and what's special about research there? Uh, my answer is that uh, it depends on what you regard as the center uh, of data science. Uh, so what do you think uh, is the center of data science? Well, many of you may think that data, obvious, right? Data is the center of data science. Indeed, we deal with different types of data, text data, uh, network data, image, uh, video, so on and so forth. Um, but are there other answers? Well, some of you may think that uh, no, data is not a uh, center of data science uh, in the science that the models are, right? So we build machine learning models. And sometimes they're called algorithms. Sometimes we call them analysis. Uh, and, um, you know, fancier term uh, nowadays that we call those uh, models AIs, right? So these functions are actually distinguishing us from people who are, uh, you know, handling uh, large-scale data, but not actually discovering knowledge from them. Those are good answers too. Are there other answers? Some of us may think that uh, it's not a data, it's not a model. It's actually uh, the product of the model, right? Uh, sometimes we call them outputs. Uh, we call them predictions, labels, right? We call them outcomes if we're talking about uh, the context uh, in, in a particular uh, application. And obvious that we call them different applications. So those are all good answers. Right, and uh, if we use uh, the uh, notations that we're familiar with uh, to denote these three things, we could use x, y, and f, 
right? And you can see that uh, conventional data science research or machine learning research is essentially finding the right f, the function that maps uh, the input data x to the output y, right? And objective uh, is usually to minimize the expected loss uh, of uh, this function and the true label y, the y that we could actually observe or uh, collect from cloud sourcing. So how is the research uh, in iSchool different? Right? Are there other answers to uh, what is in the center of data science? I know that it's hard to uh, receive answers from the audience, uh, but uh, in our view that there's another element that is uh, as important as these three, and if not more important, and that is uh, what we denote as edge, yes, humans, right? Uh, so in our view that uh, the people should be in the center of the data science uh, you know, uh, research, uh, and uh, the human is, inter is uh, uh, integrated into this framework in multiple ways. Uh, data, is usually generated from the daily activities of humans, right? Think about social media analysis, think about healthcare, think about education. We are dealing with uh, human generated data, right? And nowadays, if you look at uh, a modern machine learning system or AI system, that you can usually discover that humans are no longer just the users or the uh, data providers of the system. Actually, the user is part of the system, right? Uh, the uh, algorithms take insights from humans uh, through um, uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback, and humans can actually actively uh, steer the machine, like how you actually interact with the larger model nowadays, right? You, the human, actually, uh, you know, construct uh, instructions uh, to actually uh, make the function uh, differently from its default form. And when we're talking about applications, talking about the output of the data science procedure, what we really care about is no longer just uh, the um, um, precisions or records or metrics. What we really care about is how these results can actually influence uh, the humans who actually generated the data at the first place. So this is a new paradigm that we call the data science of the people, by the people, and for the people. You can see that it is a little bit, um, um, it's, it's a little bit um, uh, salesman speech, but. Uh, What's actually unique here is that the objective function is human-centered data science is no longer to minimize expected error of the function. And instead, our goal is to maximize the utility right, uh, of the outcome. The utility of the outcome given the human and given the function. Right? Uh, does that make sense? Uh, I'm not sure whether there are questions. Uh, feel free to ask any questions. If not, I'm going to move on. OK, so why do we like this uh, diagram, right? You can see that as computer scientists that we love these uh, uh, graph diagrams, right? Because if you have a graph, and you can actually uh, you know, traverse on the graph. And in fact, if you traverse on this simple uh, network, uh, every path, every trajectory could help you define different uh, paradigms of data science research. For example, you could draw the line here from X to F and to Y, and that is uh, the conventional type of uh, data science research uh, that corresponds to uh, text mining if we deal with text data, graph neural networks if we deal with uh, graph data, behavior data mining if you deal with uh, user behaviors, and of course, language modeling, right? Uh, we were doing uh, language modeling way before uh, it was called large language models, right? Um, so uh, in this trajectory, you can see that the focus is more on X and F and uh, less on Y and not really uh, on humans. Mm -hmm. But you could draw the different uh, trajectory. For example, if you draw the circle from X to F and to H and then go back to X, this actually indicates the diagram called interactive machine learning, right? Where the users are actually brought into the loop of the machine learning function and the user uh, you know, interact with the machine learning system to provide uh, either judgments or directly influence the model and then generate more data that's, uh, you know, being considered by the algorithm as well. Similarly, if you draw the circle on the right-hand side uh, from F to Y and to H, and then if you draw the loop, 
this actually corresponds to the explainable machine learning, right? Where the output is not just the prediction, right, of the data. The output is the uh, uh, is the um, prediction and explanations that you can actually generate to show the users, so that the users can actually um, either better accept or decline the results. The users could also better interact uh, with the machine learning algorithm. So this is known as the explainable machine learning. You could also draw the uh, line here, and you can see that the difference is that it now focuses more on the outcome and the impact of the outcome to the humans. So we can see that uh, this paradigm uh, is related to trustworthy, fair, and equitable machine learning. Uh, sometimes we uh, call them fact. Uh, and uh, it also corresponds to particular uh, user-centered applications uh, like search engines or recommended systems that we're familiar with. And also uh, it could actually uh, correspond to causal inference where the goal is not to just predict the outcome, but the goal is to figure out the mechanism and then to find the right interventions that will actually change people's behaviors. You could even go uh, more, uh, uh, you know, ambitiously that you can actually draw a big circle uh, to connect all the parts, right? And you can draw the loop. Uh, and this is what we could call uh, the end-to-end -end data science, where uh, user generated data and then the user participate in uh, the uh, machine learning process, generates the output, and the output would actually intervene, would actually change people's behavior. And through this intervention that uh, the users generate new data, and that will actually go into uh, the next iteration of the loop, right? And in a way that most uh, real world applications uh, can actually be um, uh, you know, mapped like this. So in our groups that we worked on applications related to finding misinformation online, uh, building uh, you know, uh, solutions for healthcare, right? For microfinancing, uh, crowdfunding, and we built uh, solutions to promote, uh, you know, the uh, uh, users' productivity in gig economy, uh, and we built solutions for social good. So these are good examples of, uh, you know, leveraging this diagram of uh, uh, human-centered data science. So what I'm going to talk about uh, in this talk corresponds to one particular uh, aspect of this diagram. Uh, basically on the right-hand side. Uh, and you can see that there's human, there's function. And we particularly talk about the large language models as uh, the uh, the function. Uh, and then the outcome uh, that could correspond to any, uh, you know, uh, information uh, seeking or information consumption task uh, that you deal with large language models, right? So uh, we call this uh, human AI or more specifically human uh, large language model collaboration. Uh, the reason we call this is because that the objective is no longer to minimize the error or to just maximize uh, the uh, utility of the human. It is actually seeking for the what we call a complementarity uh, of the collaboration. So the utility that uh, you do a task with the machine and with human should be better, should be uh, higher than the utility of if you do this task with human alone or if you do this task with AI alone. Does that make sense? So how to solve this problem? Uh, this looks like a grand challenge where you can actually uh, find the complementarity of human uh, AI collaboration. So to facilitate that, the first thing we may think about is whether AI wants to collaborate with us. Right. So we should first understand the behaviors or the preferences of AIs. Right. We know that uh, we, we know how the large language models were trained. So we know that uh, the objective is to predict, uh, you know, uh, the uh, next sentence based on uh, the uh, input context. But it does not really explain the behaviors uh, of large language models. If we could understand the behaviors, uh, we could try to steer the behaviors uh, of uh, LLMs so that we can actually teach it to do certain things. And if we can understand uh, the preference uh, and the objective of large language models, uh, the next step would be to align them with the human preferences, right? And the societal values then uh, we really need to facilitate this uh, uh, collaboration between the two parties, right? And you can see that to approach those problems, 
we're moving uh, away from the pure computer science style thinking, but uh, moving towards uh, an emerging um, you know, interdisciplinary field, uh, which we could actually call it AI behavioral science. And uh, we need uh, the understanding, uh, we need the models, uh, the computation from CS, but we also need insights, uh, solutions from uh, the fields where people are familiar with understanding human behaviors, uh, like psychology, like cognitive science, uh, economies, uh, and uh, other fields. So that's it. Uh, you know, uh, let's get into the first part uh, of this talk, uh, where we build, uh, you know, systems to assess AI's personalities and behavior. Right, and this is based on uh, one of our recent papers published at the uh, PNAS journal. Uh, which is the multidisciplinary journal. Um, so before doing that, do you really believe that the LMs or large language models have personalities? <laughs> do AIs have personalities at all? Well, many people may think that uh, you know they don't, right? Because we know how they're trained, right? And uh, if you ask the AIs, they will always tell you that, hey, I'm a large language model, <laughs> right? I don't really have personalities. I don't have preferences, right? But those are what they say, right? Uh, can we trust uh, exactly what they say? In fact, there are anecdotal interesting examples you can often see from the internet that, you know, after interacting with the uh, large language model for a while, and you can actually see that, uh, uh, it may tell you that it actually has personalities or at least show preferences, right, of doing things. But beyond personalities, uh, what's even more interesting is their behavior. And that is another thing that's beyond what they say, that is how they make uh, decisions, right? What are the choices they make under different uh, circumstances? There are also interesting examples, right? I'm sure that you have already seen many examples like this. Uh, you know, uh, these are either insights from uh, sophisticated uh, prompt engineering or chain of thoughts, uh, but what's Amazing is that uh, adding these uh, simple descriptions, right? Uh, simple, uh, you know, uh, instructions into the prompt, you can usually uh, manipulate uh, LLMs to do better jobs uh, in certain tasks, right? And these are probably very hard to understood by you know the objective of predicting the next sentence, right? Based on the context, right? Um, so how to understand this? Why would uh, large language models behave differently according to different contexts? Do they really have a preference, right? Do they really have a utility function that is beyond uh, the uh, maximizing the likelihood of the uh, you know, uh, generated sentence? So let's try to approach that, right? First question we want to ask is whether uh, large language models have personality traits. How do we even know? Right, we can't just ask them, right? But there's one thing that we know. If you want to know whether what are the personality traits of humans, what would you do? So how do we measure the personality traits of humans? Well, there are insights from psychology, right? Uh, you basically ask the subject to take a survey, right? And standard questionnaires, you ask them 50 questions. Instead of directly uh, asking, are you a nice person, <laughs> right? You ask them, uh, you know, to respond to 50 questions. Uh, each of them will actually help you assess their, uh, you know, uh, tendencies uh, in different scenarios. And one such test is called the Ocean's Test or Big Five uh, Personality Tests uh, that has been used uh, in psychology for a while. Uh, the reason it's called the Ocean's or Big Five is because it actually have uh, five uh, dimensions. Right, uh, including the openness to experience, uh, uh, consciousness, uh, extroversion, agreeableness, and uh, neuroticism. Right, so each aspect uh, you can consider as the uh, sort of uh, independent dimension that will help you profile uh, the person's personality. Right, for example, uh, openness. Uh, you know, if you have a high openness, that means this person is more curious and open to new things. And if you have a no uh, openness through the questionnaire, uh, that means that this person is more traditional, right? Uh, and uh, not very open to, uh, you know, uh, uh, not curious enough to new things. Uh, and agreeable, uh, agreeableness, uh, if someone has the high agreeableness, then uh, they're 
you know, nicer, they are more social, they are more compassionate versus if someone has the no uh, gratefulness, they're more rigid and uh, judgmental, uh, things like that. So these tests have been used uh, in the field for many years, right, to assess humans, right? Uh, what we did uh, it, it, as one of the studies in our paper is to uh, ask the same questions, uh, um, you know, uh, for uh, ChatGPT 3 and 4, so two versions of ChatGPT. We basically uh, use exactly the same questionnaire, uh, frame them as the, uh, you know, a prompt that they would respond. And then we query each instance of uh, ChatGPT 30 times. So we can actually get a distribution uh, that is the five-dimensional uh, profile of the personality traits uh, uh, of the AIs. And we compare uh, these distributions uh, with the distribution that we draw from responses uh, of nearly 20,000 human subjects. And you can actually see that, uh, you know, uh, the figure on the right-hand side, uh, you know, compares the distributions from human and the distributions from AI. So what can we tell from this distribution? Uh, we can see that uh, if we only compare the mean, right, uh, the responses of ChatGPT4 at least uh, is not so much different from the mean of humans. Uh, and uh, ChatGPT3 uh, is less similar to humans, but uh, in particular that uh, it has the lower openness, right? But the mean is still well in the range of the human distribution, except, except that uh, the variance is actually much lower among the AI responses. Uh, I see the question from the audience. Uh, yeah. Hi. Um, so I would just like to ask um, that, you know, when you're asking these questions to humans, uh, you can expect them. Uh, I mean, they're going in to take the test with the promise that they're going to be honest with the responses. <laughs> but right. I think with chat GPT and things like that, a lot of responses might, you know, be explicitly moderated. Like it's, it's you know, moderated to not output harmful things and, you know, mm. all of those uh, those questions. So how do you account for that? That is a very good question. Uh... You know, we, we don't really have a way to accommodate that. And actually, humans, when they are responding to these questions, they are not all <laughs> completely honest. Of course. Uh, <laughs> especially when these tests have been used uh, in, uh, let's say, job interviews, <laughs> right? Uh, and yeah. you know, uh, humans may also uh, expect that some of the questions are asking. Those questions, uh, the standard questionnaire is better than directly asking Hey, whether you're an open person or whether you are, uh, you have a high agreeableness, right? Uh, but still, that uh, you know, there's a way to figure out, uh, um, you know, uh, what might be uh, the better answer than others. Um, but this is a great question. That also shows that we need to go beyond uh, what the models or what the humans say and then look at how they make decisions uh, in certain scenarios, which we will cover uh, in, in the next part. Thank you. Thanks. So the next question uh, is very uh, well motivated. Uh, is can we go beyond what they say? Because if you uh, you know ask them to respond to question answers, it's better than just asking them whether you have personalities. But still, that uh, it is based on what they say, right? Can we go beyond that and really understand uh, their behavior, right? That means the choices that they make, uh, right? The decisions they make, uh, the actions they take uh, under different contexts. Right. So do you believe that large language models have behavior traits? Right. Again, the question is how can we even know? Right. Uh, uh, we can uh, again ask the behavior questions that people ask in the interviews. Right. Uh, the question is, uh, you know, before the, uh, you know, before we are interested in AI behavior, right? What do we use to measure human behavior? Right. How do scientists use to measure the behavior tendencies of humans? And turns out that we can also draw the insights from behavior sciences, and this time from behavior economics, right? And the practice uh, of understanding human behavior in behavior economics is to play games, right? We, we like games, right? And these games are not computer games. These games are, you know, uh, uh, you know, highly theoretical, um, you know, uh, be, uh, economic games, right? And um, you know, without spending too much time on you know, this, what they are, why don't we play one, right? And this is actually what we uh, used to let ChatGPT play as well. So we start the conversation with, hi, let's play a game, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, in this game, you're paired with another player, 
The role is to decide how to divide one hundred dollars, and the other there we have to receive. We have to you know agree with your choice. So if you have one hundred dollars, how would you like to divide the money? How much would you like to give to the other player who have zero say in the decision? <laughs> Unfortunately, we cannot do the survey uh, in the classroom, but uh, anyone who wants to give a try. <laughs> Uh, there's probably a game theoretic answer, um, but we'll just play. I'll say, I'm not going to give him anything. Now what happens? Nice. Well, uh, okay. So one of the, uh, choice is give nothing to the player. Any other answers? <laughs> 50, 50. 50, 50. Ah, that uh, uh, immediately there's the difference, <laughs> right? Any other answers? Be fair, nine. Uh, sorry that I didn't catch your answer. Did you say one hundred? Sorry, I was going to say give one hundred dollars away. Wow. <laughs> the other suggestions was ninety ten. Ninety ten. So you got ninety, and the other player got ten, or the area around. <laughs> First. Uh, nice. Well, in fact, I, guess I would say that give them hundred dollars, but also ask them what what they would do for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, see, that's why that we don't use real, uh, you know, uh, computer games, right? We we uh, restrict this context into, uh, you know, uh, uh, this uh, clear game. So this game actually has the name called the Dictator Game, where you're acting as the dictator, right? It's the game to test uh, the altruism, right, of the subject. If you're interested, you can see that uh, the distribution of human responses actually have multiple peaks, right? Um, uh, so we collected the answers from, I think, uh, 88,000 human subjects uh, to this particular question. Most of them were students. Uh, and you can see that um, James' answer is actually one of the peaks. It's actually a mod, right? <laughs> um, but there are many other answers. You can see how uh, you know answers are distributed. There's another peak surrounding 50-50, right? And these people wanted to uh, you know uh, split a share, uh, you know, um, a portion of the money to each of the players. Well, we did this uh, for ChatGPT three and ChatGPT four. You can see that um, upon thirty tries, ChatGPT four's answer has been very stable. They would always split the money half and half. <laughs> and chat GP3 is sort of more neutral, right? It does not uh, give 50-50, right? It also does not uh, give nothing uh, to the other player, even though that we can actually dictate the outcome, right? So if you compare these distributions to the human distributions, you can see that, well, there are within the range of human distributions, they usually correspond to one uh, or more peaks, right, uh, in the human distribution. But this does not represent, uh, you know, uh, the wide spectrum diversity. Let's look at a different one. This, this game is called the ultimate game, right? It is a lot similar to a dictator game. However, now if you propose the split between the responder uh, and yourself, the responder can choose either to accept or reject your proposal. If they accept, then both of you will split the money as uh, you propose. But if they reject, then none of you will get anything, right? So you will not get the 100 uh, at all. The decision now actually depends on the other player's decision. So in this case, how much would you like to propose to give? James, would you still uh, want to give their look? <laughs> no, now I go 50-50. Now you go 50-50. Good call. <laughs> Any other answers? This time I'll go with 99-1. 99 Wow, that means that you will give 99 to the other player. You just need one, right? Sixty-five forty-five. Fifty-five forty-five. All great answers. <laughs> Let's see. So this is distribution. <laughs> 
a hundred. This is the distribution from the uh, you know uh, tens of thousands of human subjects. You can see that now uh, the mode uh, is actually 50-50. Uh, but there are uh, people who will actually give 99 or 100, uh, actually 99, that's the maximum to uh, the other player. But there are still some, uh, you know, human subjects who wanted to just give one, right? Uh, and now if you look at the distribution of ChatGPT 4, it, it's still very strict, uh, you know, uh, that if it gives as the a fair split. But ChatGPT 3 would now actually give more than what they propose to give uh, in a dictator game. Still not 50-50, but uh, close. Uh, another side of the ultimate game is to play uh, as the responder, right? So the question is that in such a scenario, as the responder, what is the minimum amount that the other person proposed that you would accept? So now you're actually not proposing the split. You're actually responding to the split. <laughs> Any difference? <laughs> Anything I guess more? except at least 75. You accept at least 75. Nice. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> Anything more than zero? At least Anything I... more than zero. That's uh, that's very rational. <laughs> Here's the distribution. You can see that uh Hamid's answer is actually aligned with uh uh you know, a large proportion that they, they can accept anything about their own, right? But there are still uh, a large amount of people who want, uh, who, you know, wanted a fair share, even though that they know, um, you know, uh, they could actually get their own, right? Now, if you look at ChatGPT uh, decision, you can see that uh, there's the more diversity. And, you know, uh, among the 30 rounds of uh, ChatGPT4, there are actually three picks, right? Accepting some, at, uh, you know, something as uh, small as one or a fair split 50-50 or something in between, right? You can see that its response is still well in the range of human distribution corresponding to multiple peaks. Uh, and ChatGPT3, uh, the decision is quite different from ChatGPT4. There's another game that uh, you may have already heard. Uh, actually you should have heard it's called the prisoner's dilemma right basically the two players uh, can either uh, you know cooperate with each other or betray each other right in this case if they choose to cooperate right then they will both get 400 that will maximize their joint uh, you know outcome because uh, in total that they would get 800 but if they choose to betray each other if both of them betray then they get a uh, smaller uh, you know uh, payoff if one of them betrays another one, it's still be enough to cover it. Then only the one who betrays the others actually get uh, more, but uh, actually way more <laughs> than cooperation. Under this scenario, which is actually a very common scenario in real life, there are many, many uh, real life uh, you know, applications. Uh, would you choose to cooperate? Or would you choose to uh, uh, betray each other? This time I will just show the answer, right? If you look at the human distribution, actually 45 versus 55, 45% of humans will actually choose to cooperate, even they know, if they know that uh, the dominating strategy is to be tricked. <laughs> but ChatGPT is way nicer. So they're more willing to cooperate with humans, even if they know that uh, the dominating strategy is to be tricked. Right, so they wanted to, uh, you know, uh, optimize the joint payoff uh, rather than just maximizing their personal payoff. And in fact, we have a suit of uh, uh, six games like this, all from uh, classical behavioral economics literature. Um, uh, two of the games have, um, uh, you know, two rows, so we have eight games in total, and they are uh, used widely used to test different uh, aspects of. Uh, behavioral dependency, like autism, like fairness, like trust, right? Like um, uh, uh, re reciprocity, like risk conversion, uh, cooperation, right? As well as uh, strategic reason, right? And we compare the answers of uh, uh, chat GPTs uh, with 88,000 uh, human subjects, mostly, as I said, our uh, college students. Uh, so we can actually compare the distributions. Looks like that. Uh, 
GPT distributions are well in the range of humans, but not uh, as diverse. But the question is, can we draw the conclusion, right, whether their, sim uh, their behaviors are similar enough to humans? So how to draw this conclusion? Well, uh, we seek for the help uh, of the classical test called Turing test. Uh, as computer scientists, that I don't think that we uh, need to, uh, uh, you know, go very deep into that, right? It has been a, a gold standard of testing uh, AIs, right? Basically, uh, there's the human interrogator who interacts with the machine and uh, another human, right, uh, through text uh, communications, uh, uh, and uh, they don't know their identities, right? If they can uh, tell which one is machine and which one is human, right, um, mm -hmm. then, you know, uh, human wins. Uh, then if uh, they couldn't tell which one is AI, which one is human, then the AI wins, right? So this is also the game called the imitation game. You can see that uh, the classical Turing test uh, is also based on uh, the texture communication. So based on what they say, right? As we said that we're more interested in what they do, what they decide rather than what the AS is. So we introduced a variant of the Turing test called the behavior Turing test. Basically, we let the AI and humans to play uh, these classical games. Uh, and we interrogate based on their behavior choices rather than their words, right? And we are able, because we have the distribution of human responses and the distributions of uh, chat GPT responses. So we're able to simulate a lot of the uh, Turing tests uh, like this. Basically from the human distribution, right? We pick one answer randomly. And then from AI distribution, we also pick one answer, right? One act, uh, so X and Y. X is the AI's decision, Y is human's decision. And then uh, we assume that interrogator uh, knows the human distribution, but not the AIs, right? Uh, which is common because uh, you know uh, you know what it means for a human, but you don't really know uh, what an AI will do. And uh, we can repeat this for 10,000 times. In each of the random draw that we decide uh, AI wins the test if the AI's action randomly sampled from its distribution is more likely to be from the human's distribution, right? Rather than the, the uh, one action sampled from a human distribution. And there's the tie uh, if this likelihood is equal. The AI loses uh, this uh, imitation game if um, you know its action is less likely to be generated from a human distribution than the random sampled uh, human distribution. Does that make sense? And then because we can actually sample this, uh, redo this test 10,000 times, we're able to, uh, you know, uh, estimate, uh, you know, the percentage of games uh, that, uh, you know, the chat GPT-4 would actually win or the chat GPT-3 would actually win against a random human, right? We also included, uh, you know, the, the sanity check uh, with, you know, a human versus another random human. Right, so these should actually have an equal uh, win rate. And then we summarize the results among the eight game scenarios. Uh, and you can see that on average that ChatGPT4 actually wins, uh, um, you know, uh, in a more, uh, in a larger proportion of the games uh, rather than losing to the human. And there's the 30% of the games that there's the tie, right? And in fact, that ChatGPT would actually win uh, this uh, behavior Turing test uh, in six among the eight uh, game scenarios, right? So uh, we could say that ChatGPT4 has passed this uh, behavior Turing test, but ChatGPT3 could not in most of the games. So this is actually a way to, uh, you know, uh, judge how similar, uh, you know, GPT's uh, behaviors are comparing to humans. Any questions? So far. All right. Um, okay. So I have one question. Sorry. So I was just looking at the prisoner's dilemma. So yes. what makes humans appear AI like in that game? Because what, could you could you say it again? What makes uh, humans? Uh, so it seems like only twenty four point eight percent of the times uh, for human, you're estimated to be a human. So I'm just wondering, like, what about that game, um, you know, basically makes uh, humans fail that test, sort of. So 
Yes. Oh, um, well, yeah, so uh, I think uh, I probably haven't uh, introduced that clearly. So this human bar, uh, the third bar in each uh, figure is the sanity check, where, you know, you randomly sample one human action uh, and okay. play against another human action sampled from the human disorder. Oh, I see. So I see. Um, you, if the test uh, is correct, then you should always see, uh, you, you know, uh, the same, uh, you know, winning rate. But, okay. but in many cases, that there's a tie because you know the action is the same, <laughs> the sample action is basically the same. Then right. uh, that's the tie, right? Okay. But in this case, you can see that even though that you think ChatGPT four is nicer right? because it tries to maximize the joint uh, utility, uh, the behavior is not uh, similar to humans, right? Because right. more humans will actually choose to uh, defect. So uh, this is good. Uh, this helps us understand, uh, you know, how similar uh, ChatGPT's behaviors are to humans. Uh, but these are per, uh, you know, uh, per game uh, observations. In fact, what we wanted to do uh, is to go beyond the games and try to uh, reveal their preferences, right? Is there something generalizable across the games? Is there something that we can say about the true preference of these AIs, right? So. To do this, uh, we basically make assumption that the AI has the uh, generalizable utility and it trades off its own payoff and the partner's payoff. And in each of the games that the uh, self payoff and the partner's payoff are defined differently, right? And by doing that, we wanted to understand how did AI trade off between their self trade off payoff and their partner's payoff. And this will give us the preference that to what extent that AI would actually, uh, you know, just focus on their own payoff versus they would like to, you know, maximize the, the social welfare, right? Um, in this case, we introduced a particular model of the utility, uh, and that is uh, actually uh, uh, interpolation of the self payoff and partner's payoff uh, in each of the games. Right, so you can see that B is the factor that uh, you know balances uh, over self payoff and the partner's payoff, and this uh, uh, exponent R is actually uh, an exponent uh, that basically says that whether this is the linear interpolation or this is something nonlinear. If R equals to one, then that means it's the linear interpolation. Um, and here uh, you can see that uh, we assume that there is some. Uh, you know, parameter B that is generalizable uh, across the games. If B equals to one, that means that the AI is purely selfish, right? Their utility that they are trying to maximize is essentially their own payoff. If B equals to zero, then uh, the AI is acting purely altruistic, right? Uh, or selfness. And because we have all the, uh, you know, uh, individual inter uh, uh, actions of the AIs, uh, and we know this uh, distribution of humans, so we can actually estimate uh, the B uh, across eight games uh, with mean squared error. The basic assumption is that uh, given a particular B, then there's the uh, maximum utility, right? That uh, the AI could have get if they choose uh, you know, the dominating strategy uh, under this particular utility function. And uh, the AI's action would help them get the utility this far. So there's actually error, right? That means that how well they're maximizing uh, the expected uh, you know, maximum utility in that game, right? By finding the B that, maximize, uh, that minimizes the mean squared error, uh, we think that uh, this trade-off uh, would actually uh, reveal the underneath uh, preference of the AI. So what do you think? Can you guess that what could be uh, the B of the AIs? <laughs> or what could be the B of uh, an average human? <laughs> Surprisingly, uh, the average, uh, the, 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 you know, um, best B for AIs is actually the profile five. That is strictly, right? Uh, balancing between uh, their self utility, right? And their partner's payoff, right? Versus uh, if you look at the trade-off between the average human computed from the white human distribution, it is around 0 0.6. So it's 
so they're close, but you can actually see that the AIs are actually even more artistic uh, than the average human, right? The left, uh, the left finger is using R equals to one, the linear intensity interpolation, and the right figure uses the long linear that is called the constant density of substitution that economists use to model the infinity function between uh, capital and neighbor. Uh, and you can see that uh, the conclusions are sort of similar, right? Uh, the AI's balance uh, is right in the middle, right? And the humans are slightly towards uh, the selfish side. Um, so uh, we also test whether uh, the large language model's behavior can be steered by staging uh, the context, by framing the context differently. For example, in the dictator game, right, uh, if we just ask them to do uh, the split uh, without any information, so you have already seen their decisions, uh, but if we tell them that someone is watching, <laughs> right, there's a game host, uh, who's watching how you are actually making the splits. We'll think about how you would do differently. Or if you ask them to explain uh, their uh, you know, decision explicitly, then you can see that the behavior of ChatGPT3 actually becomes more generous, <laughs> right? Similar observations were made in economics literature about humans. In the ultimate game, as responder, remember that game, uh, if we tell ChatGPT4 that uh, the proposer who proposed the split uh, has the particular gender, right? Uh, basically, we use the binary gender here. Um, you can see that the distribution becomes different, right? But uh, interestingly, this is regardless of uh, which gender, right? As long as you tell uh, ChatGPT4 that the proposer uh, is either female or male, then uh, they are uh, respond differently. And what's more interesting here is that if you tell ChatGPT to play the role of a certain occupation, right? Uh, basically, if you tell ChatGPT that you're a mathematician and here's your job description, how to define a mathematician, then you can see that they are more likely to accept anything that is greater than zero, right? So congratulations, Hamid, you're a mathematician. <laughs> Versus if you tell ChatGPT that uh, you're playing the role of a public relations specialist or even a legislator, right? You can see that it's 50, 50, right? I think James, you're a legislator. <laughs> There's at least one of the answers that is, uh, uh, demanding, a uh, that is demanding a 50, 50 split. Right, even if someone else is making the proposal. So you can see that uh, if you stage the context uh, to uh, ChatGPT, uh, their behavior uh, preference can be steered by considering that context. So this is promising. Uh, from this initial study, we can see that uh, we're able to test, we're able to assess, uh, you know, the large learning model's behavior preference. And we can show that there behaviorally similar to average humans, right? Uh, but their distribution of their uh, behavior is much narrower than the entire human population, right? They correspond to particular peaks in the distribution while uh, well in the range has the Turing test, but uh, the distribution is much narrower. And we also show that their behavior is steerable by stage in the context by asking them to actually play a particular role. So this leads us to the grand question, whether we can contextualize the AIs mm -hmm. so that their behaviors can actually represent the diversity, the massive diversity of the human preferences, right? And this is actually the work that we have been thinking about, uh, haven't got, uh, you know, sure results yet. Uh, but one potential solution uh, that this group uh, would be uh, very familiar with is how about let's teach large models to personalize? How about let's teach large models to actually make decisions uh, uh, corresponding to each individual human's preference? If we can do that, then if we pull all these uh, personalized instances of LOMs, then they could probably represent the massive diversity of human responses.
So this is something that we could call it a distributional alignment to uh, be uh, distinguished with the alignment of LMs that basically try to align the mean, right, to the human judgments. Um, I probably don't have a lot of time, but I will probably spend five minutes to talk about uh, the uh, some of the work that I've been uh, doing recently with colleagues at Google. Uh, the idea is to teach large language models to personalize. Uh, and because this topic is so familiar uh, to this audience, uh, I just need to introduce a little bit about the recent work. Um, so to teach large language models to personalize, the goal is basically uh, you know, to generate answers uh, based on the user's query uh, as if the answer is generated uh, by the human, by the uh, user uh, themselves, right? Um, there are many different ways you can actually ask the human to specify everything, but that's too much burden on the user, right? Or you could, you know, do per user uh, RLHF, right? Believing that uh, this is something that people have tried. Um, uh, but this is still too much burden to the user, and uh, one model per user is not feasible, not feasible at all, right? Then uh, a more modern approach uh, would be to fine tune uh, large language models based on human data, based on personal data, rather than you know uh, doing reinforcement learning on the fly. Uh, still too much burden and costly. Right, and then using RAG, uh, this is actually uh, first proposed by the famous LAMP paper uh, done by the audience here, uh, is to um, um, retrieve the content from uh, the personal context and then ask LM to consider the retrieved context and generate uh, the results, right? So what we did uh, is to, uh, you know, uh, teach large language models to consider the retrieved context. Instead of just fit them uh, the context and ask them to generate personal context, uh, personal content, uh, we asked large language models to first read uh, the retrieved content and try to synthesize uh, the sources into insights and then generate. Uh, so basically we asked it to, you know, transform the retrieved content into insights. Uh, the definition of insights are either summaries or, uh, you know, synergies uh, among the uh, results. So basically, ask them to digest the retrieved results uh, before they actually do the personalized generation. And these are some insights, uh, you know, from the writing education, where if you ask the students to write, uh, you know, an article from a given source, uh, you do not ask them to write first. You ask them to find relevant information, evaluate information, summarizing them, synthesizing them, and then finally to create uh, the output. And uh, we basically did the same thing uh, by fine tuning the large language model so that they can not only uh, just consider retrieve the context, they first rank the results, they generate a summary, and then they synthesize the retrieved information into important keywords or writing styles. And then uh, they are able to produce this meta uh, you know, instruction uh, and then consider this meta uh, introduction and then generate personalized content. Then we also look at uh, what if the large language model is frozen, so you cannot really teach them to uh, you know, fine tune their answers uh, based on uh, this training process. So in this scenario, said, the only thing that we could do is to optimize the prompts, uh, right? And then we uh, introduced uh, the uh, model that chance of surprise learning and uh, reinforcement learning where we take the initial uh, you know, prompt that maybe this meta prompt after uh, the nice uh, you know, uh, personalization training. Uh, and then uh, we uh, um, use super learning to update, uh, to predict what could be a better prompt. And then based on better prompt, uh, we apply reinforcement learning to uh, you know, update the wording right, automatically so that it generates some more effective uh, you know, instruction to generate personalized text. Uh, this is this paper is published in this year's uh, World Wide Web conference, right? Beyond the models, we also, uh, you know, uh, investigated how to evaluate personalization, right? Because, uh, you know, ideally, the personalization should be evaluated by uh, the, the user who actually uh, submitted the query uh, in the first place, 
But in reality, this is infeasible. So we usually use human readers. We ask others to pretend that they're the user. Uh, or we you know, ask the user to write references. And then we just use the references as the proxy and apply the uh, natural language generation matrix like blue or rouge uh, to um, uh, you know, uh, provide uh, the quantitative evaluation of generated content. And the idea here is instead of using others to pretend that they're the uh, users or to use references, we uh, you know, uh, used a large language model to consider the same personalized context uh, and then to judge uh, the three aspects of the generated content, uh, the quality, the relevance, and personalization of the uh, uh, generated content by the personalized large language model. And uh, the good results that in short that uh, this approach uh, is more accurate than human readers or the reference-based uh, natural language generation metrics. And it is more consistent and robust and of course more efficient. Um, so um, just to summarize the second part that we have shown that large language models can be taught to personalize the generation. Uh, with minimal user burden and cost. And in this process, you can see that there are actually multiple roles that large language models could play. Uh, obviously, they serve as the generator, but they could serve as the role of a student where they learn to comprehend the retrieved material before they actually do the writing. They could play the role of the instructor of a TA, so they actually update uh, the instructions uh, Right, uh, using the prompt writer before they actually uh, send this instruction to the generator. They could also serve the role of the evaluator. So you can see that large language model actually serves as multiple human-like roles uh, in this big process, right? And in general, that we covered two topics uh, in this talk. Uh, we spend more time covering how we can assess the behavior personality of large language models. Uh, with a behavior Turing test. And then we show how we can actually personalize large language models so that their preferences, their behaviors can be aligned with individuals. And we consider them as initial steps towards uh, AI behavior science, that is the interdisciplinary field that caused the collaboration between computer scientists, information scientists, economists, uh, uh, and people from other uh, behavior science fields. And that's it. Uh, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, uh, thank my co-authors. Uh, the first uh, approach, the first paper uh, was done with my student Yu Tong Shi and uh, my colleagues Walter Yuan from Mob Lab and uh, Matt Jackson from Stanford, who's the economist. And the uh, teaching large language models to personalize that line of work were done by uh, colleagues in Google. And uh, you probably would recognize at least two of them, right, from uh, this exact uh, CIR group. And thank you very much. And uh, I'm not sure whether I still have time for questions, but feel free to ask. Thank you so much. Actually, three of them are from CIR. Oh, three of them. Which three? Faith, Jepu, and Michael. Nice. OK. Well, at least two. I said at least two, right? <laughs> uh, OK, thank you so much for the very interesting uh, talk. Um, and any questions from the audience? Um, thank you for the very interesting talk. Uh, if we go back to the slides of the like AI Turing test, behavioral test, we see that you know for ChatGPT three, um, people could tell from humans and. Uh, chat gpt3 and i was just wondering like what kind of like answers could sort of like reveal that you are an ai instead of humans uh mm -hmm. do you have any sort of like i know the answer is like very complicated but mm -hmm. you elaborate more on like what kind of answers would reveal sure so this slide right is this slide that you're referring to yes exactly right so you can see that uh, if you look at ChatGPT3, uh, what are the games that uh, they do poorly comparing to uh, the humans? One is the dictator game. Apparently, that uh, you know ChatGPT3 uses the sort of a uh, you know uh, 
intermediate approach. I do not want to give nothing to the other player. I also do not want to be, uh, you know, strictly fair to get 50-50. So I would actually choose the, uh, the action in between, like give 30 or 40. But this is not corresponding to the human strategy. You can see that in the human distribution, if you remember that a uh, big portion of people uh, like uh, James would actually give nothing. And uh, another big chunk of people would actually give 50-50, right? So uh, not a lot of people would actually use the uh, you know intermediate approach Thank so you. That, that would be one uh, good example right other examples are uh, the trust game uh, that uh, uh, that is not introduced in this talk uh, but you can actually refer to the paper it has to do with the investor uh, investor uh, who decide on how much money I want to invest to the banker who will actually uh, generate uh, three times revenue, but they may decide how much they would return to the uh, investor. So that will actually have things to do with uh, risk uh, aversion, right? And with the trust. I see. So those are good examples, uh, right? Uh, another example is the ultimate responder. You can see that, you know, uh, ChatGP4 has three peaks, if you remember, that will correspond to the answers from, uh, you know, the classroom. Right? Mm -hmm. We had three uh, answers, and they will correspond to the response of uh, ChatGPT4's decisions. You can see how well they are aligned. But ChatGPT3 still have a sort of an intermediate approach. I guess if I may ask another question, um, I guess the conclusion is that you know, the LLMs are kind of like similar to humans in terms of like behavioral test. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if that's because of the, you know, like reinforcement learning uh, from human feedback or it's just because of the results of like predicting the next tokens. Mm -hmm. uh, like, um, I guess my question is, asking your maybe like gut feeling about this or like have you ever have you like tried doing some kind of like you know alleviation test about this kind of stuff yeah that's a really good question uh the short answer is that we don't know um you know there's no evidence that uh the uh, you know the behavior games were used in the training data so we think it's unlikely that it is because that it's just predicting the next token Right, because those games are so specific in terms of the frame. Um, and uh, uh, human uh, feedback um, could be, because we don't exactly know, uh, you know, what are the tests that people used uh, in uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback. But what's important here is that you can see, uh, you know, in human, uh, in, in reinforcement learning with human feedback, normally you actually align the model to the mean of the users. Right, rather than uh, the wide spectrum of distribution, mm -hmm. right, and this is something that we really want to take away from this analysis. Uh, you can see that in many cases, that if you consider the human pop uh, population, their preferences have multiple peaks, right? And there's the very diverse uh, range of answers, right? So if you want to do uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback, you need to make sure that uh, you know which population are you aligned to. Right, and whether you're just aligning the mean, right, of the um, of the output, or whether you're aligned to the full distribution, we think those are very important implications to the AI practitioners. Mm 